Let's go ahead and sing number 281, Jesus Saves. sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land. Climb the steeps and cross the waves. Onward tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, wafted on the rolling tide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, tell to sinners far and wide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, sing ye islands of the sea, echo back ye ocean caves. Earth shall keep her jubilee. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Give the winds a mighty voice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout salvation full and free, highest hills and deepest games. This our song of victory, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let's go over our prayer list here real quick. This Thursday evening. Does anyone have any prayer requests before we start? No prayer requests? Okay. Yes. Oh, yes, sir. Donna Gad. Donna Gad. She is uh, a niece, and she has terminal cancer. She also had the virus. Uh, the virus didn't do her real bad, but she is just Existing. Okay. Just remember her and her family, and uh, remember her mom. Okay. Donna Gad. All right. On our list, we have uh, again uh, all kinds of. Here we go. Sam, uh, sorry, scrolling down. Sam Barton, Hunter, and Logan Barton on our prayer list. Skip Dalton, Loretta, Susie Gregory, and her son Michael. How's Michael doing, Miss Tina? Michael's doing good. Doing good. Okay. Okay, good. That's great. All right. Alexis Huffman, Myra Ramey and her family, Brandy Tyreer, Sylvia Manchin. I mentioned it last two weeks online. It's hard to tell who watches online. I know everybody gets busy. So sometimes when we go online, I don't know if everyone hears the prayer request or, or not. But uh, uh, Miss Sylvia mentioned her Aunt Helen's family. Uh, her aunt would be 102. And her grandson lost his wife to uh, the virus. So to keep their family in prayer. Um, uh, Brother Larry, how's your back doing? Good. Okay, good, good. Not a good time for back pain and back problems and all the snow that we've been having. So uh, let's pray for Brother Larry's back as it gets better. Miss um, Vicky, you're feeling good? Amen. All right, Miss Vicky had a fall out front. And uh, yeah, this weather is just, no one told me about this last year. No one mentioned the weather in Bland. Everybody said, oh, it's a mild winter in Bland. Don't, it, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's, we told you. My kids have seen more snow than they've seen in their entire life in, 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 in one year, I, I believe. Uh, but it's beautiful, though, when we see the snow. It's, it's amazing. We see how pretty it is. And uh, uh, yeah, we've seen, you've seen more snow in, in the last three months than you've seen in 21 years. Yeah. Uh, pray for uh, Don Pruitt and Miss Ann and, uh, and her sister Louise. Uh, pray for Brother Gary and Miss Sylvia. Pray that uh, they have the opportunity to get back in church because they've had a lot going on. And uh, Brother Gary's knee, then to his toe, and then Miss Sylvia's has some health concerns. And let's pray that they uh, are able to get back in church and pray for Brother Gary's healing. Uh, Brad Sargent, let's pray for him. He had some surgery, I guess a biopsy that turned more into a little more involved than what they had thought. And, and he, they kept him overnight. I believe he's home now. Had some problems with his oxygen. 
Like when it can't get worse, you get home with oxygen and you can't get your oxygen to work. Can you imagine? So let's keep Brad and uh, in our prayers. Also, Miss Diane and Brother Bob as they help take care of Brad with everything that's going on there. Uh, those uh, pray for Miss Wanda and all those in our church family who uh, suffer, have suffered the loss of loved ones over the last couple months. And uh, it's going to be hard as the months go on, but let's keep all of them in prayer. Pray for Miss Wanda. And pray for her daughter, right? I believe I, heard, I just, it's my little time that I was downstairs last night setting up the camera, I heard a prayer request for uh, Miss Wanda's daughters for her health. So let's pray for her. Pray for Miss Wanda. Pray for, pray for Brother Bill and Miss Vicki, Miss, uh, Miss Elsie's family, and uh, Samantha and Nathan. Pray for them. Uh, pray for the Reynolds family. Pray for Willie Nelson, who is uh, Miss Alice Nelson's son. Pray for him. Pray for uh, the, uh, Miss Diane's daughters. Uh, and pray for Brother Carol's stepdaughters and their families. Um, I don't know their spiritual condition. God does. That's his business, not mine. But let's pray for them. And if they don't know Jesus, let's pray somehow as they see uh, their family's uh, dedication to their churches. Uh, let's pray that through that, they, uh, God will use that to get glory out of all of that situation that took place in December. Uh, of course, Miss Angela's family, her uncle Larry passed away several weeks ago. Let's keep them. This is kind of an ongoing list. I have Miss Sylvia also mentioned to families here in Bland, the Carol, Sing, uh, Carol Sue King Williams family. Uh, who, uh, Carol Sue King Williams passed away, and Joyce Doonan passed away uh, about a week and a half ago. So let's keep those folks in, our, in prayer. A lot, of, a lot going on. Virus still going strong. And uh, pray that God has mercy in our community. Pray, pray for our country. I don't even bother watching the news anymore. <laughs> uh, pray for our country. It's in serious, serious decline, serious, serious trouble. And we are under God's judgment. I know everyone's so worried the judgment of God's going to come. I got news for you. The judgment of God is here. And we are living it. And when you see they just passed another abortion law, I think, or this past week. I forget where I saw that newspaper article where now if, you, now if a baby survives an abortion... They still don't have to keep it alive. And, uh, excuse me, if, they, if the baby survives abortion, they can't praise, uh, put criminal charges against the doctors if the baby survives. So this is going to be commonplace. It's going to happen. As Christians, we, we should never uh, accept it, but we're going to have to understand that it's going to be just a way of the future as these laws keep passing and passing and passing and passing. And Pray for our country. Uh, pray that God uh, sends one last great awakening to this country. He doesn't have to. The way we've treated him, the way we've, the, the millions of, of, of innocent lives that we've taken from the womb, and uh, the way we've profaned his definition of family, of marriage, and the way that we've slapped him in the face uh, and mocked his creation, his very crowning achievement of creating that. He, Jesus said he created them both male and female. And we've profaned that, and we've elevated it even to the highest positions of our government. We have a health secretary who thinks she's a woman. But when she dies and they dig her up a couple hundred years from now, the archaeologist is going to say, we found the bones of a man. I mean, we've spit in God's face as a country. I mean, his creation. No, you didn't create us this way, God. You don't know how you created us. We're under God's judgment. Let's pray for our country. Pray for our law enforcement, our military. Pray for, pray for our community here in Bland and what God's going to do here. Pray for our church and what God's going to do here. I believe God's going to do great things at our church. Uh, once the fall happens and the virus passes, I, gotta, I, I, I feel very confident. I know God will honor uh, our faithfulness to him. Pray for, uh, yeah, pray for our church. Women's Bible study was last, last evening. I pray it was a blessing. I haven't watched it. I'm going to watch it and put it online for the women to watch, those who couldn't make it. Please share it when it goes online to anyone you think would be interested. I, I'm so thankful for everybody who shared the women's Bible study. We've gotten a lot of messages from people that uh, don't come to our church uh, who have uh, took an interest in it and liked it and, and found it a blessing. I think that's awesome. That guy's going to use that that way. And uh, we're going to be working on a men's uh, prayer breakfast soon. Matter of fact, I might talk to some of the men before they leave tonight and uh, think of some good ideas to how we can safely like, have tons of breakfast food and, and some fellowship. So, Brother Fred, would you like to open us in a word of prayer this evening? Heavenly Father, thank you for gathering us in your house today. 
Lord, there's plenty of needs, and we know that you're aware of each one of those needs. There's plenty of people to be prayed for, and Lord, we know you're aware of those. Lord, at this moment, I'd like to ask you to look in our hearts, look in our minds, in our needs, and I ask that you would accept the prayers that we would have for all that you've done for us, Lord. There's too many things to number, too many things to speak of, but Lord, we know that you love us. And Lord, we're sorry that we don't return the appropriate amount of love in many instances. Lord, we ask that you be with us during this service, that only what you would have to be preached instead of what you <coughs> is in Christ Jesus' name we pray these prayers. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and sing number 161, Softly and Tenderly. Typically, we'd be taking our tithes and offerings, but uh, in honor of social distancing, we will not be doing that. There's a plate out on the back table, and uh, we have a drop box on the side of the church. And you can also mail your tithes and offerings to our P.O. box. And soon, uh, I was talking to Brother Larry about this, we'll have online a way to give. Uh, if you prefer to do that, I don't know many, how many of you give online, but uh, we'll have a portal on our website, our new website. So for even those folks who don't belong to the church, who want to support our ministry, they have a way to do that. And uh, so we'll, it's just a, another option we'll have, and that'll be up shortly. Ian is working on our website, and Delaney's helping there with that as well. So uh, that'll be done. I want to thank, send some thanks out to uh, Brother Bill Major, who uh, uh, came down here and installed our thermostats. 
Thank you, Brother Bill. Brother Larry was with him. Appreciate your help. Want to give a praise to God that we do not need a new heating unit as of yet. <laughs> That's a praise. Those heating units, you know, I think of those heating units. Someone said they were 26 years old. Is that true? 26? Yeah, older. older. How old? 86. You know, when you read the story of the uh, children of Israel, they wandered through the wilderness. I don't know if you guys ever know this part of the story, but I think it's amazing, this part of the story. God was, was so caring and so protective of those people in the children of Israel that uh, their clothes didn't get old. Their shoes didn't get old during that 40 years in the wilderness. They never had to change shoes. Their clothes never wore out. Thankful that God has a heating unit. Uh, that he knows that we don't need a new one. I'm thankful he's kept this one running and thankful that the gentleman who came uh, here, Brother Larry was sharing with me, the gentleman who came here to, to look at the, the HVAC, helped build this church. Didn't charge us for uh, his visit, but a blessing. Randy Compton. What's that? Randy Compton. Randy Compton. That, uh, what, a, what a praise that is that we, you know, God knows that our needs and he supplied. That's awesome. That's awesome. If you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 1. We'll continue in our uh, teaching and preaching here from the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1. Have your Bibles ready and then Ian's going to sing a song for us and then we'll get into our message. Oh, sure. Yes, Miss Vicky, go right ahead. Everybody's good. What a praise. Anybody else have a praise they want to share? What a, God's a good God. Miss Tina, go ahead. Amen. See, man, God is good. God is good. Sometimes all we, all we do is focus on the bad stuff, and God's good. He provides. And we have a, 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 I'm going to praise him for my salvation right now. I'm going to praise him that he gave us away from my family and I get down off that hill. I'm going to praise him for that. I'm going to praise him for uh, the, the, the home he's given us and praise him for the church that he allows us to serve at. And God's a good God. He's an amazing God. Thankful that my daughter uh, has got a job offer from her college. I'm thankful for that. Thankful for so many things. Thankful. Wow. Thank you for that praise. Anybody, anybody else want to share a praise tonight? I'm, I'm ready to go on a little, little praise sharing time if you want. God's a good God, Ian. Right. Thankful for the ones. But think of all the praises we don't know about. God's constantly working. He's constantly moving. He's constantly, he's got his hands on the pulse of everything. One thing we'll get through from Ephesians that we'll understand is uh, when you get past all the election and predestination, when you get past all of that, all you know is that God, we don't make a move. I think I said last Thursday, uh, those people that don't want to use the word sovereign, they don't sneeze without God knowing that. Think about that. That's how mighty God is. He knows your needs. He sent that man who helped do that. He HVAC who helped build this church. I, I, when, you hear, when you hear how God puts it all together, it's absolutely amazing. Amen. All right, Ian, sing, sing a song for us. Lost will under 
Ephesians chapter 1, please stand and honor the reading of the word of God if you're able, if not, please remain seated. Ephesians chapter 1, start in verse 3, the Bible says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, and whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Father, thank you for this day and everything you've given us. I thank you for your word. I ask you to give me, give me the gift of preaching this evening, Lord, the gift of teaching. Father, I pray you have me say everything you want me to say and nothing you wouldn't have me to say. Lord, help me to speak boldly the truth of your word. Pray the Holy Spirit will touch our hearts and our minds and lead us into all truth. Pray this message which is glory and honor to you and to the name of your Son. It's his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to move past the, the sticky stuff, <laughs> past ele election and predestination and all those things. But uh, we started off calling this series Identity Crisis. And it a lot of Christians have a misunderstanding of God. A lot of Christians flounder and fall off into false teaching because they don't understand who God is. And even worse than that, sometimes they don't understand who they are in Christ. When we get saved, uh, we have a new identity. And Ephesians in these first couple chapters is a great way to, for Christians to comprehend and grasp really who they are in Christ and not have an, this identity crisis that many of us suffer from. And we looked at uh, verses 3 through 14, and we talked about how in the original letter when Paul wrote this to the church at Ephesus, it was one long sentence. Paul just go, starts in verse 3 and just goes on and just, I mean, matter of fact, he'd probably be graded improperly in school for having a run-on sentence here. But, but he goes on in, this, in, this, in these uh, 11 verses He's just gushing over all the blessings that God has given us as believers, right? If you look in verse 1, he's writing to uh, the church at Ephesus, to the saints which are at Ephesus, to the faithful in Christ Jesus. He's writing to believers. He's writing to you. He's writing to me by application. And he's going to say, look, church, blessed be God. He's the source of all of this spiritual wealth. And then he goes down through these 11 verses and lists several parts that... Uh, comprise these true spiritual wealth. And I mentioned before that a lot of times we, we look at uh, uh, people around us and our neighbors and, and we, man, we want what they got and we, we I want to be like the Joneses or the, the whoever, whoever lives next door to you. And our bank accounts may not reflect the people next door to us sometimes, but uh, 
I have news for you. As a believer in Christ, you are rich beyond your wildest dreams. You have more treasure and more wealth that God has given you than the richest people in the world. You, you make the Waltons from Walmart look like, like they're hurting. That's how rich we are in Christ. I mean, the problem is our minds are so set on worldly things that it's hard for us to get pulled away from that to focus on his word to see what the blessings we do have. I mean, we, we get all the way down. We went through all of those things that, that uh, we've been blessed with, uh, and then we're going to kind of go through those one by one. But you get down here, and I noticed that just in that last, one of those last verses I read that we have an inheritance in verse 14, which is also the earnest of our inheritance. We have an inheritance that's being kept by God, being guarded by God in heaven for us that we're going to get. I've seen people, uh, I've seen churches split over inheritances. I've seen pe- families divided over inheritance. I- I've seen uh, people flock in like vultures at the time of an inheritance. We don't have to worry about any of that. We don't want what they got down here. We got an inheritance in heaven that God has guarded for us. Uh, the earnest of our inheritance we have it waiting for us in heaven. It's in heavenly places, as Paul talks about here. So we started talking about the identity crisis, and I kind of went into this who done it about, and I looked at the things that God had, had done, God explicitly had done. I said, salvation is, well, the Bible says salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is by grace through faith. It's either all by grace, or it's none by, or it's not by anything at all. It's not by grace at all. Salvation is, is purely of God, and man a lot of times reverses those roles, and man wants so hard to believe that he has something to do with it. But the truth is that the Bible says in Psalms, and Paul quotes it again in Romans, that no one seeks after God. We are dead in our trespasses and our sin. No, I mean, the Bible says it twice. No one seeketh after God. No one is good. We are in, you've seen the commercials, I don't know if they still air the commercial with the woman who has the little metal, medical alert bracelet and she falls down the step, steps and she said, I've fallen and I can't get up. You've heard that commercial? That's a true picture of our spirituality. When Adam fell, we fell in Adam and we can't get up. We can't pull ourselves up. We can't do anything to hoist ourselves up. If we could do anything, if we played any part in it, God would never have had to send his son to die on a cross. I know man wants so hard to think that we got something to do with it, but we don't. Right? Remember, we looked at uh, a couple weeks ago before this, I can't remember how many snowstorms we've had now, but we looked at the fact that uh, it says in John, Jesus says that no one comes to the Father unless he's drawn. That word drawn means dragged. It doesn't mean he comes not of his own will. It doesn't mean somehow we, we, can, we can't resist God's drawing. As, you know, the Calvinists would say irresistible grace. But it does mean that when the Holy Spirit draws, no one can come. You can't just come on your own accord. The Holy Spirit's going to convict you and draw. I mean, you've got people that come and say, well, I'm going to get saved just because I don't want to go to hell. And they're going to come up and they're going to say a prayer and think, I got saved. I did it. I walked up. Everybody else walked up. It was kind of cool. I don't even know why I did it. I just didn't want to go to hell. They call that a get out of jail car, uh, get out of jail free car. When I was in school, they called that fire insurance. Salvation is not fire insurance. But man thinks he can just come up and do whatever he wants. I mean, the thing, the truth is, no one comes until the Father draws him. The thing is, if you look back at when you gave your life to Christ, when you first trusted in Christ, there was probably a time in your life where the Holy Spirit got a hold of you and let you realize that you were a dirty, rotten sinner, and that you had no tra- chance on your own to somehow get to God, and you felt that draw from the Holy Spirit, something that made you maybe, something made, maybe, maybe it made you sit in your seat and bow your head and say, I put my faith and trust in God. Maybe it, draw, maybe it drew you out of your seat to, to an altar. I have news for you. I happen to believe when somebody gets saved and they walk to the altar, if they walk to an altar, I have, I have a feeling they're saved before they even stand up out of their seat. They've repented in their heart. They've realized they were a sinner. They stood up and they walked up just to make a profession. But the thing is, I'm sure if we went around this room, people could testify when God got a hold of you and let you realize what you were and how you needed him. We have people today that don't even know they're sinners. They just don't want to go to hell. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to do this because I don't want to go to hell. I don't even know who Jesus is. I don't even know what he did. I just don't want to burn. That's not salvation. That's not salvation. So, the point of all of that was to say this. We looked at three things that God did. He says here, Paul says in God's word, this is God's word. And I want to tell you, when you get in this first 
just these first five verses of the book of Ephesians. I mentioned it last Thursday night on, on the YouTube message. We are getting into territory, into depths of spiritual territory that we can't even fathom. These, these first couple, when we read these verses, I mean, some people will argue over these doctrines so much so that, that they'll break up friendships over it, they'll leave churches, and they'll, our men have been arguing for hundreds of years over these, these couple, several verses. But the truth is, we're not meant to argue over these verses. These verses right here that Paul's reading that talk about election and predestination, right? These verses don't tell you how to get saved. They don't tell you you can't get saved either. These verses don't say, well, only God's going to select a few and the rest he's going to send to hell. They don't say that. That's not what Paul's talking about. All Paul's saying, look, blessed be God for all these blessings he given, he's given us. This is what spiritual wealth is. And let me just tell you about them. And then he goes 11 verses. It's not meant for men to fight over and, and dispute. This is just Paul telling you the way that it is. And when he talks about something that happened before the foundation of the world, let's be honest. The only way we can know anything about what happened before the foundation of the world is if the Holy Spirit reveals it in his, in his word. None of us were there. When you start talking about things that happened before the foundation of the world, you're talking about depths that we can't even fathom as men. Right? We can't even begin to be, think what happened before the foundation. This is before God even said, let there be light. Holy Spirit's just giving us a little glimpse into how good God is. So he, the things that we said, part of our identity crisis about this whodunit, these first three things that God did. And what we're going to see, by the way, is that in this first chapter of Ephesians, Paul's going to go through the Trinity. He's going to go through the Father, and he's going to go through the Son, and he's going to go through the Holy Spirit. And he's going to show you things that each one of them did. Right. Look here. I'll show you the ones that God did. We talked about it. Verse four, according as he that's God hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world for your identity crisis. If you have a problem with your identity, know first that you're chosen. God chose you before the foundation of the world. The minute you get saved, by the way. You now know you were one of the elect. <laughs> we don't preach. Uh, I mentioned last week, God has nothing to say to a lost world about election. He has nothing to say to a lost, lost world about predestination. See, some people think of this doctrine as it's, it's pushing you people away and it's showing how mean God is. You see, they think, well, God's telling me here that he's chosen this person, but he's chosen this person to go to hell. But it doesn't say that. Matter of fact, that's not even a gospel message because who's Paul writing to? He's writing to the saints at the church at Ephesus. He's writing to Christians. He's saying, Christians, look. You've been chosen. God chose you. Matter of fact, he marked you out to be a son or a daughter by adoption. And he's made you acceptable in the beloved because we can't make ourselves acceptable. If we could, Christ would not have had to die. Some people look at this as, as, a, as, a, as a way, a roadblock, and how it shows how cold and calculating God is, and he's up there with puppet strings picking and choosing who, who's going to go to heaven and who's going to go to hell. And that's not what this passage is about at all. Please understand that it's a uh, 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 it's uh, he's not talking about that. He's just saying, look, this is what God has done. You should be thankful. God chose. We were chosen. He also says we were, we were marked out because that word predestinated means marked out. God marked us out into adoption of children by Jesus Christ. Remember, you go through that door that says whosoever will. Right. We don't preach election for salvation, do we? When we go out and, and share the gospel with folks. We don't we don't pull up Ephesians one and say, I'm not sure if you're one of the elect. If you're not, then you're not even going to care about this. I won't even talk to you. Maybe you're one of the elect. Let me tell you about the gospel. We don't do that. That's not what the gospel is. We're told to preach the gospel to every creature. And the gospel message is whosoever will, right? Whosoever will. That's what the doorway says when you go in. But when you turn around, it's going to say, whom he foreordained, who he foreknew, he hath chosen before the foundation of the world. What's on that other side of the door is not for our minds to fathom. So God's chosen us, he's marked us out, and he has made us accepted in the beloved. So we're chosen, we're marked out, and we have been made accepted. So if you have an identity crisis, think of that, you were chosen. God knew his church. Remember, he knew, we, many people think that when, Adam, when Eve ate the apple and gave it to Adam, and Adam ate the apple, and the whole fall took place in Genesis, that God had to some, somehow sit down and come up with a big plan B. What am I going to do now? It was good in Genesis 1, and in Genesis 3, it's not good. What am I going to do now? Oh, no. I got an idea. I'm going to send my son. No, that's not how it happened. 
God knew. Because he tells us in the New Testament, again, something else that happens before the foundation of the world that we would never even, uh, weren't even there, we can't even fathom it. It's a mystery that Paul's being, being revealed by Paul through the Holy Spirit, that there was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. He knew that Adam was going to fall. He knew that man was going to fall, but it's no problem because he had the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Not only that, he knew each member of the church because he chose them in Christ before the foundation of the world. I can't explain that to you. Don't let your brains get hooked on that. <laughs> That's just who God is. Okay, he's chosen us, he's, he's marked us out, he's, uh, and he's made us accepted. So I want to go into look tonight a little further into this verse and finish, get pa- now that we're past this election and predestination, I want us to look at uh, some of the reasons why he did that. Because he's going to give us two reasons why he chose us before the foundation of the world. I want to look at that tonight, I want to keep going. So we're going to be tonight in this, in this second half of verse 4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So why did he? We know who did it. God did it. But why did he do it? Why did he do it? Why did God choose us before the foundation of the world? One of, one of the biggest false uh, accusations that's brought against uh, this doctrine of election, when people argue over this, is that it weakens our morality. That's one of the arguments that used. I think it's a crazy argument. But they'll say, well, if we were chosen, if, we were already cho- if God already chose us, this is pretty cool because we can live any way we want because we're chosen. So I'm chosen. I can't be unchosen. So I'm just going to party it up for the rest of my I can live any way I want. That's what people think. If you're chosen, you can live any way you want to. But think of what Paul says. This, uh, Paul, who's writing to the Romans, he says this. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Meaning God forbids it. He won't allow it. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer in sin? The whole idea and the whole point of salvation is that it's deliverance from sin. Salvation is deliverance from sin. I mentioned when we talked about the armor of God that many people think salvation is to be saved from hell. And while that is, while that is true, that's an ends to the means, that's not why Jesus came. Jesus didn't come to save us from hell. Remember we talked about the shoes that are shod with the, with the peace of the gospel, the good news of, of the gospel. We said, what is the good news of the gospel? Is the good news of the gospel that we're not going to go to hell? Well, that's great news. But that's not the good news of the gospel. The good news of the gospel is the peace. That are on the, the peace that, that Christ's death brought peace between man and God. And what caused that breach in peace? What caused the, the phone line to be cut? or the connection to be cut, was when man fell and sin entered because God is holy. He could not have sinful man in his way, so sin separated us from God. And we were at war with God because we were sinners. And because God is a holy God, he can't have sin in his presence. We were at war with him. He he couldn't even look at us. So somebody had to make peace in that war, and Christ came. And that's the peace of the, the gospel. And because of that good news of peace, yes, we won't go to hell. But so many people are getting saved because they don't want to go to hell. Because they don't want to burn. Now, God can use that, I believe, as motivation for getting you saved. Because the Holy Spirit does convict us of sin and righteousness and judgment. And the judgment of sin is death and eternity in hell. So so that's all uh, good. But the truth is, is that... uh, it's sin is the whole issue. Deliverance from sin. The whole point of salvation is deliverance from sin. So this whole idea that, that if you, if you're, because you're elect, you somehow can live any way you want is just hogwash. Because sin is about uh, deliverance from sin. Nowadays, when you hear about the gospel being preached in many places, they don't preach sin. Matter of fact, I, I look at many of the, even the independent fundamental Baptist uh, door-to-door salvation, soul winning, uh, when you buy them and they give you the step-by-step, uh, not the step-by-step to give them, but the step-by-step to teach the people to go out. That's what I mean. And they, and they give you this and you go out and you got this little thing. Very, and many of them, many of the biggest churches, there's one in Indiana that's a huge, what well, used to be a huge Baptist church, and they didn't even talk about sin. Their question was, if you died tomorrow, would you know if you were going to go to heaven? That's a great question, by the way. It's a great opener. But that was it. Well, you don't want to go to, you don't want to, go to hell, do you? Well, who say this prayer, brother? Amen. Welcome to the family of God. 
They figure you'll deal with the sin later. But uh, if you turn in your Bibles, I, I just want you to see this because you may want to underline this passage. If you didn't know it was there, it's Matthew chapter 1. Just, I just want you to see it. Matthew chapter 1. Then we'll jump back into Ephesians. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. I want to show you why Jesus came. We all know the, probably this verse. This is when the angel is visiting Mary. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from hell. No. He shall save his people from their sins. And by saving him from their sins, of course, he'll save them from hell. See, man doesn't, Jesus can't do what man wants him to do. Man wants him to save him from hell, but not from his sins. Because see, man likes their sins. I'm going to say this prayer. I'm going to get into the whole Jesus thing. I'm going to get saved from hell. But you know what? I still like my sins. But it's all good because I'm saved from hell now. That's how man thinks. Jesus can't save you from hell until he saves you from your sins first. And that's why he came, to save you from your sins. And by saving you from your sins, he will save you from hell. So I just want to show you that in Matthew 1, 21. You might want to underline that just in case somebody says, no, no, we can deal with our sins later. No, 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 he came to save you from your sins. That's why he came, because we're sinners, and that's the problem. So anyway, uh, the first thing, the first reason why God chose us before the foundation of the world, it says it right here, is this. He says uh, that we should be holy, that we should be holy. And that talks about our position as believers Talks about our position as believers. The main reason that God chose us before the foundation of the world was because of his holiness. And I just mentioned that a minute ago. I mean, God is so holy and God is so pure that nothing unholy can make its way into his presence. All right. I remember I, I mentioned to you several times, but I, felt, I was amazed when I learned this it was a big eye opening experience for me when I thought it was always holy and then unholy. All those unholy things, they're horrible. Look at them. They're so dark and ugly and unholy. But then these things are holy. But the truth, the meaning of the word holy is this. There's holy and there's everything else. Like the word profane, like now we, use, we have the word profanity and the word profane has like a, a ne really negative meaning. But profane just means anything that's not holy. God is holy. Everything else is profane. That's why in the Old Testament, when, when God sent the prophets to, to uh, yell at the preachers, he was yelling, he was sending condemnation against the preachers because they were saying, you don't draw the line between what's holy and profane. Because they were using regular worldly things to come before God and glorify him. They weren't, weren't always using evil, dirty, detestable things like we think of unholy. Oh, those unholy things. God was saying, look, don't mix what's with the world with what's separated and holy. So there's holy and there's everything else. So God, God wants us to, the reason, one of the first reason is our position is that we're holy. Nothing unholy can come into the presence of God, right? And there's a major problem for us because why? We're fallen humans. And when, we're, when we accept Christ as our Savior and we're adopted into his family, uh, we are made holy. But the problem's still there. We're, we're going to sin, right? We're not holy like God. Because we're, because we're unholy people, because we're not holy, God's holiness, who he is, demands that he impart his holiness on us. That's what it means when we get sanctified, when we're saved. The word saints, where that comes from, it's our position. Positionally, in God's eyes, we are set apart and sanctified, and he imparts holiness on us. That's why we're called saints when we're saved. Today, we, we have a major problem uh, that gets very uh, sticky for us sometimes because uh, people confuse God's main attribute. Today, we hear all the time that God is love, right? Ironically, we hear it from the other side of the aisle, don't we? Oh, God's love. God wants me to marry who I want to marry because God is love. God doesn't care uh, what gender I, think, I believe I am because God wants me to be happy because God is love. Do we not hear that? 
God would never send uh, an unbelieving person to hell because God is love. Look, it says it right in John. God is love. Have you heard that? I've heard it many a times. Matter of fact, it's, it's, it's used so much in the negative now that ultimately love becomes God for many people. What they do, they have a, a major problem. Many, even many preachers, false teachers, and uh, what they do is they confuse two things. They take a God's moral attribute, which is love, right? That's how God deals with man. God so loved the world. God loves us. We know that. That's, I'm not saying God doesn't love us. God is the true definition of love. God is love. John does tell us that. But they take how God reacts with man, how God deals with man. And what they do is they elevate that over a natural attribute of God. Right? God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He's, he's omnipotent. He's all, he's all powerful. He's, he's holy. He's righteous. He's just. These are attributes of God. I mean, in Sunday school, we're going over the names of God. Now we're going to jump after Sunday school. When we're done with the names of God, we're going to go right into the attributes of God. And these are things like holiness and righteousness and just, just God being just. So they take this, this moral attribute, how God relates to man, which is love, and they elevate that over one of his natural beauties, so a natural, which is what God is by nature, his nature, the nature of God. And what happens because of that is they create a God in their own image that deals with mankind according to his love rather than his holiness. That's what they do. That's why you hear God could never send anyone to hell because he's love. Your own book says it. And sometimes Christians don't know how to deal with that and they just don't know what to say. Well, that's right. I guess God is love. All right. I guess everything's okay. God's love. That's why I see so many of our churches crumbling over where their, their stances on things that always, that the Bible is a black and white stance on. God's word doesn't change. He doesn't change his view on marriage. He doesn't change his view on what he created, male or female. He doesn't create his view on murder versus, versus uh, what murder is. He doesn't change. His word doesn't change. Man changes all the time. But God's word is still as true today as it was when it was penned several thousand years ago, as it was, as Psalm says, before the foundation of the world. God's word is forever settled in heaven. Matter of fact, before even the first word of Genesis was written, this book was done in heaven. Matter of fact, God's love, uh, this whole concept of, of God being love and it overshadowing his holiness, well, you know, th that has to do with Gen uh, the Genesis uh, 3 situation with Satan. Because it's a very subtle lie. Because it's very hard to argue with somebody over how God's not love. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's a very difficult argument, isn't it? If you've ever, if you've ever been in that conversation, well, I believe they could be mar married to whoever they want because God's love. Yeah, but no, God's love. And then it's a very hard argument. It's very subtle. The devil's very subtle because he traps you. Just like he said to Eve, did, did God really say you shouldn't eat of that? Did he really say that? Let's really think of what he said. That's how it's presented to us today. It's very difficult. It's very subtle. But God's love, the fact that God is love is the fact that's all rooted in the fact that he is holy. I want to read a couple verses, you know, in the Old Testament. Uh, well, actually, let me go back, let me back up. In English, in, the, in our English language, if we want to express something in its superlative form, right, we usually add the words EST at the end, right? Holiest, right? Or that guy is the slowest guy on the court, right? Or we'll say most. He's the most, you know, uh, the most, he's the slowest or he's the, the most quickly person, you know, whatever the case, you know, I mean, we add most or EST. That's how we make something. It's superlative point in the Old Testament in Hebrew. Matter of fact, I want you to understand this is that when they wanted to create the superlative of a word, they didn't have est or most it, it back in, in, in Hebrew. So what they did was they would repeat a word uh, three times. In Hebrew, that's the way they would do that to get their point across and saying something is the holiest. They would say, holy, holy, holy. In Hebrew, that's how you would say, that's the holiest. And in, our, in God's word, I want you to, to think of this real quick, or look at this. I think we'll turn to it. Isaiah 6, 3, we'll turn to this. We're going to close here just in a few minutes. I just want us to prove, establish this holiness position of God. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3. 
We'll read it. We're going to talk about these seraphims. Verse 2, it says, Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And these angels that are around God, it says, And one cried on another and said, Lovely, lovely, lovely. Nope. Doesn't say that, does it? All right. And one cried unto another and it said, Gracious, gracious, gracious. No, doesn't say that either. Isaiah 6, verse 3 says, And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Holiness is God's one attribute that allows Him to be just, that allows Him to be righteous, that allows Him to be loving. That's holiness comes first. Holiness, I want to show you another one. You don't have to turn there, but if you want to, you can. Revelation 4, 8. We're going to get into a little end times uh, uh, imagery here in Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. Actually, I don't think it's imagery at all. I think it's quite literal of this scene that we see. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him. And they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy. Holy, Lord God Almighty, which was and is to come. God's holiness is uh, the crown of all he is. The fact that he is holy. And many people today strip God of his holiness and throw it over here somewhere in the corner and just want to deal with a God who's love, 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 love. A God that has no right, a God that won't judge, a God that has no righteousness, a God that a, a grandfatherly guy is going to just pat you on your back and send you on your way and say, it's okay. I love you. That's not God's number one attribute. God is love. Oh, God so loved the world. He loved, matter of fact, he hated, he lo think of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, right? We know the rest. Whosoever, it's a whosoever verse. But think of this. We, we look at it in terms of God's love. For God, so loved, for, so God so, for God so loved the whole world. But think about this. God was so holy. His holiness was so uh, apparent, and he knew that he, because of his holiness, he couldn't have sin in his, in his presence. And because of his holiness, he sent his son to die so that we could be made holy, so we could be in his presence. That's how much he loved us, but he hated sin so much because he's holy. A holy God can't have sin in his presence so why did, what's one of the reasons why God chose us before the foundation of the world? Why did he draw us? Why did we believe? So God could make us holy. So that we could one day enter into his presence. He's holy. And that's what it says. Again, we'll read that passage in, in Ephesians. He hath chosen us, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy. And that's our position. That's our position. I don't want to go any further tonight, but the next, he also chose us for one other reason. It says here, to be without blame. Actually, I can finish this up real quick. It won't take long. Holiness is our position. We're made. When we, the minute we put our faith and trust in Christ and we're saved, you're set apart. Brother Bill, you're a saint. Brother Tom, you're a saint. Luke, you're a saint. Don't have to jump through hoops and get your... Have your face show up in a piece of toast in Rome or something to be voted on as a saint. You don't have to do that. The minute you're saved, you're a saint. Okay? But he also says this. According as he has chosen for the foundation of the world, that we should be holy, here it is, and without blame before him in love. Without blame. Without blame. I'll just finish up with this. That's also, that's not our position. This is our practice. Without blame speaks of how we're to live our lives. Because he has made us holy and put us in a position of holiness, we in turn should be blameless. That word blameless, by the way, is a word that means without blemish, spotless, free from fallfulness. That's the word they use when you brought a sacrifice in Leviticus. When you brought a sacrifice to the altar, it had to be without spot or blemish. That's what that word without blame means. 
That's how we're to be. That's why God chose us, that we'd be holy, we'd be set apart, and we'd be blameless. In our position, he looks at us as being holy. But in our, in our practice on how we're to, li to live our lives, we are to be blameless. And I want to no notice one thing before we close. It says blameless before God. That word before has the idea of looking down into. Remember, God sees everything we do. Sometimes we're like Israel. We think we can do things and God ain't paying attention. God doesn't care. God can't see me here. I know so many kids that won't, uh, you know, they, 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 around their parents, they have this wonderful mouth. You get them away from their parents, all of a sudden they cuss like a sailor. <laughs> My parents can't see me. Isn't it funny? I mean, the same thing at work. We, I mean, I know there's people, they have rules at work about profanity and stuff like that. And, and you have men and women that have worked their whole day at their job and not say a, a, a foul word at all because they think, I don't, want to be, I don't want my boss to see me. <laughs> and then they get out of work and get in their car and then there they go, they're letting the words fly right and left. Isn't it funny that God's the one who sees them? They're worried about, a, kids are worried about a parent. Some people are worried about their boss. But yet God is the one who sees them. He's chosen us before the foundational world that we should be holy in our position. He's chosen us before the foundational world that we should be without blame before him. Remember, God sees everything that we do. Does that mean we're supposed to live a perfect, sinless life? No. That's why John says, I write to you that you don't sin. But if you do sin, we have an advocate. And that's Christ Jesus to the Father. Paul goes through Romans 7. He talks about this battle he faces about. He knows he wants to do good, but his flesh just doesn't want to do good. And he's going to fail and he's going to fall. Right? We're going to sin. This, without blame doesn't mean that we're going to just live some perfectly, perfect life. But it means we're going to strive to live our, our life pure, with a purity as Christ has. So we're chosen before the foundation of the world, all for him, that we can be holy, set apart in our position, and without blame in our practice. We're getting a little more picture of our identity, of our identity here. We're chosen, chosen that we can be holy. We, thank, we should be thankful for that, right? We should be thankful that God chose us, that God drew us, that we heard, he allowed us to hear the gospel message one time in our lives. We should be thankful that God gave us a praying grandmother or God gave us Christian parents or God put us in a, in a place where we happen to hear the, the gospel. We don't understand how God works all that out. Can you imagine the computer program you must need to program if you're going to program God's providence? This guy, Kevin's going to be here at this time, and he's going to go to this school, and then 20 years later, he's going to take this turn and make this left, and he's going to meet this guy. And think of, your, think of your test, each of your testimonies. But I'm thankful that God chose, that we're chosen. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that we're marked out. I'm thankful that he's made us acceptable, and he made us acceptable, and he chose us to make us holy in our position and blameless, without blame, in our practice. Father, thank you for this day and everything you've given us. I thank you for your word, the truth that it holds. I thank you for these, just the amazing amount of information that's just outlined in just these few verses in this book of Ephesians. Father, I pray the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. Help us as we uh, spend our time in your word. Let us grow closer to you, Father. I pray you take us home safely this evening. Be with us as this weather comes. Bring us back here Sunday, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.